Welcome to campmaker.com. I'd like to share with you our approach to building camper vans. To begin with, we, we try to do a more simple approach to how things are put together. It's easy to make things complex, so we work hard to keep things simple. The layouts have more of an open feel rather than congestion. Uh, many RVs, RV manufacturers, they suffer from the attempt to try to cram every kind of RV feature known to mankind into a tiny little space. These vans are designed for off-grid camping rather than uh, staying at RV parks with full hookups. And an attempt to have a lower carbon footprint. Um, on a good day, Campmaker van can get at least 20 miles to the gallon. And, you know, obviously many RVs are closer to about eight. And these aren't quickly built vans. Uh, often it'll take us about 18 months to complete a van. Here's the basic layout that we're working from for, for uh, this latest model. It's got a, an additional seat, a three person bench seat, um, an or open area in the middle with the kitchen and uh, some seating as well as the across the bed, east west uh, bed in the back over uh, what's often referred to as the garage area. One of the goals is reduced weight of the overall van conversion. This reduced weight helps the engine, the transmission, the brakes, gas mileage. Uh, we often get 20 miles to the gallon on the highway. And with a lighter van than the, the 280 horse engine is, is powerful and it's quick, there's really no issues there. Because it's a front wheel drive, you want to try to keep the majority of the van weight on the front wheels. So if at least has more than 50% of the overall vehicle weight, then your traction is significantly better. This improves traction in snow as well as back roads. So right now there's about 3,700 pounds on the front wheels, 3,200 pounds on the rear wheels. And this total of about 7,000 pounds is approximately 2,000 pounds under the gross vehicle weight, and all of that is very helpful. A lot of people purchase an RV and use it for a few trips and then park it for the rest of the year. And especially with a nimble, um, lighter vehicle, a van can be essentially about the same amount of, say, gas mileage and all that as it would be if you were regularly driving a pickup truck. And then you can use the van for regular things going grocery shopping or an extra vehicle when some family member needs to go one direction and others are going the other way. Uh, oftentimes hauling things. I've ha hauled oh, a thousand pounds worth of flooring, for instance, one day. And so um, there's a lot of things you can use it for. And then that helps because if a vehicle just sits, then it deteriorates. And certainly with this kind of investment, you don't want to let it deteriorate. Our approach with this particular vehicle is that it would be a seating for five, which makes it a family adventure van. Um, we, we often found that it was helpful to have some additional seating for just, just depending on what the event is and, and so on. Plus, in our case, we have some grandkids, and so the chance of going on a trip with them was something that was of interest. But I've often thought about the soccer mom or soccer dad, for that matter, uh, who is traveling around uh, with your kids to different activities and how practical a vehicle like this would be. Um, it's a place to wait while your kids are wrapping up activities. There's a bed in back so you can take a nap. Um, there's a sink and a refrigerator for snacks. There's a toilet if anyone needs to use the facilities and especially with younger children, that's a huge blessing. A, a heater to keep things warm if it happens to be cold. So as well as just the fact that you can keep a lot of gear and supplies and things in the vehicle, much more so than you would in a typical um, car, that then, then you often have the things you need with you when you're out and about. Promaster vans don't come from the factory with the setup uh, for additional seating. Actually, I take that back. Uh, the last year they've started doing that. They call it, I think, the crew van. But um, there needs to be additional reinforcements underneath the frame to add a bench seat back there. A lot of people 
try to add uh, seating in the camper vans, but they don't understand all the extreme forces that can happen in the event of an accident. And so then their, their supports uh, aren't done securely. So then whoever's riding back there is in an unsafe situation. So we actually worked with a company in Tualatin, Oregon, that does this kind of install on a regular basis. And so we're very pleased with the extra support that they put underneath the vehicle. One of the myths in van life is that people need to spend an elaborate amount of time doing lots of effort to fill all the valleys in the van floor, as well as to create a very complex matrix of framing for the floor and insulation. And I think it's, uh, it's safe to say that that is not necessary and is actually detrimental to some of the goals of good insulation. And so let me share with you about some of the things that we've done that is different than that. So the framing in the floor, um, if it, a perimeter frame makes sense because you have a place to anchor things to, uh, but a minimal amount of that. And so I have a 12 foot section. So three, four foot areas that can both uh, insulation and plywood. And so then, um, then to put down the solid foam insulation inside each of those sections, cover it with plywood. I use half inch, seems to work pretty well. And then over the top of that, use a sheet vinyl, one big single piece of sheet vinyl that is uh, good for waterproofing. There are a lot of different ways to mount a solar panel on the roof of a camper van. And uh, a lot of people uh, create a roof rack and then add a lot of other equipment up there. And this can create quite a bit of crosswind problems, safety, significant loss of gas mileage, especially if you're driving down the freeway at 70 miles an hour. So if you consider, say for instance, the Airstream trailer, the whole reason for the Airstream design so it has such a rounded, smooth surface that then it makes it easy to pull down the road. Um, can you imagine adding a lot of gear to the roof of an Airstream? Um, well, it's a similar issue with the ProMaster. I mean, it, from its original design, the shape and style of a ProMaster is fairly streamlined and, uh, and does fairly well on the freeway. But when you start adding all these other accessories and things hanging off the top of the vehicle, especially because they're so tall to begin with, it, it can begin to create a number of complications. And then people make that even more complex when they add bigger tires, lift kits, and you have other issues. So my t attempt is to do something simpler. So uh, I certainly want to have some solar on the top. I need to have a, a ventilation fan. The max fan is kind of the the main fan that people use in vans. And so I have a, a low profile solar panel. It's, it's, there isn't a roof rack up on top. The solar panel itself is anchored with some really strong uh, aluminum angle irons. And uh, after all this, I, I can get good gas mileage. It has almost no wind issues with crosswinds. And so, uh, so it's okay to, to choose this approach to putting uh, things on the roof. So this van has a 200 watt solar panel mounted on the roof and gets good summer solar output. But I also added two 100 watt solar panels on the back doors. And this way it'll get better winter output. So the main advantage is the solar generation in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, we're at approximately the 45th parallel, which is halfway between the equator and the North Pole. And in these areas, the non-summer months, these panels get excellent uh, power that isn't true for the roof typically, especially if it's not like at noon, thereabouts. If you live in a snowy area, the panels then on the back doors will not have snow on them. Unlike the roof mounted panels where there's just a constant effort to clean the snow off the roof so you can get any account, any amount of of solar generation. And panels mounted on the back have no wind issues or anything like that that is true for the, the roof mounted panels. 
Insulation is uh, uh, an extended discussion on van forms and people try to do all different kinds of insulation. Some are, are more creative and there may not be good evidence as to whether that's a good idea or not. But uh, I tend to lean towards more uh, tried and true options. And in this case, it's using the polyiso foam boards mounted with, a, it's an expanded spray foam that then essentially seals the, the, the one inch form um, boards to the more flatter areas of the van. A lot of a ProMaster surface is a, is a close to a completely flat surface. And so then to add the foam boards to those areas is actually quite easy. The difficulty is the corners. And so that's where uh, insulation such as the Thinsulite is very helpful because it can conform to the, the corners much better than it would be if you're trying to put the foam boards there. I'm also uh, a good friend of mine put together an excellent study on the different types of insulation and their effect on vans. And so the link is down below here. When people build camper vans, sometimes they try to frame them out similar like you would to a house. And there's actually a number of complications when you when you approach that way. But one of those is there's only there's just a minimal a limited amount of space inside a van. And so as you build it out, you want to maximize the amount of space, interior space that's there. Um, van builders often install more permanent walls that would then, if anything happened in the future and you needed to get inside that wall, it would be almost impossible. You would have to literally like tear apart half the vehicle in order to get to those areas. So what I've tried to do is build vans in a way so they can be repaired, uh, make it easy for anyone to access uh, for maintenance, especially electrical or plumbing. Um, a difficult to remove wall panel can turn maybe like a one hour repair into a multi-day, very expensive operation. And then also in the future, if there's something additional, something you want to change, maybe you want to add a, an additional wire somewhere or things like that, then all of that is made dramatically simpler if you create your walls in, in this manner. We've created some insulated window coverings. Some people are hesitant to do too many windows because they like the, the ability to uh, more of a stealth camping. And in my case, uh, I felt like windows were really helpful to be able to look out, but I didn't want a huge detriment from windows from an insulation standpoint. So I've created these special panels that are insulated in the same way the rest of the wall panels are. Electrical system is one of the most important parts of a van build. And this system has been designed specifically for off-grid use. And it's kind of fascinating to think about that there are times when people um, would want to buy a vehicle like this, but then only park it in RV parks or someplace where you have access to shore power. Well, if that was the case, then this whole pretty extensive electrical system wouldn't be needed at all. It would be so simple if all you had to do is just plug in wherever you were. So. All that to say, uh, this is using some, a number of high quality products, uh, Blue Sea, Victron, the batteries are SOK and have some amazing ratings in terms of build quality. Some people try to then take that 100% electric van build uh, and, and, and approach it with everything. So if you were plugged in at an RV site, then absolutely you can use an electric heater. But if you're running an electric heater, on batteries, it's not going to last very long, like maybe a, a few hours and then you're done. So in general, uh, folks need to use some sort ter type of fossil fuel for heating or and or for cooking. Um, and so some van builders uh, assume that a 3000 watt inverter is, is really needed. Well, in a lot of ways, it's not a necessity. And so an attempt to make a system that is safer and more manageable as far, especially when the time comes to, uh, to uh, recharge all those batteries. Uh, I've chosen a, a slightly smaller uh, 1200 watt inverter and it actually addresses many of these problems. 
Here's a view of the installed electrical system. Sometimes when there's power outages, um, you can use the electrical system in the van to uh, plug in at your house. So in mine, on the back area, right below the brake lights, there's a, an excellent place to put uh, the plug in for shore power. And so on the left is power being plugged in. So it's sending the power into the vehicle to charge it. On the right is power coming out so that then you could use it either as, at a campsite or in, in case of a power outage at your home uh, to, uh, to power things there. A camper control panel is a helpful thing in terms of all the, the different uh, controls, remotes, switches, you name it. Sometimes these are hidden all over the van and make it kind of confusing for especially a new van owner to figure out how to manage their vehicle. This location is, is excellent for having a, a space to put, you know, put cell phones or if maybe you use a CPAP at night or whatever. And the ability to know the state of your battery charge is very important. There's also uh, Bluetooth apps for the battery monitor, for solar, for alternator, as well as the propane tank. The ProMaster doesn't have a, a lug wrench that's ideal. And so I always add like a two foot, so 24 inch breaker bar to make it so it's more convenient when the time comes if you need to change a tire. It's also a good idea to try the spare tire hoist to raise and lower that, uh, you know, at least once a year or so, just to make sure that everything's working. The cabinetry all needs to be anchored really securely. And the propane vault, if you use propane in a vehicle, uh, is very important to be secured so it doesn't move around in the vehicle, especially if you stop fast. And so the five gallon tank uh, can be put in a vented, vaulted box that's anchored to the floor. I use half-inch bolts that go through the, the, the base of the vault and through the van floor. And then industry standards for RVs uh, require that you have two vents for the propane vault. So one that's uh, up higher, closer to the top, and the other one that would be down through the, the floor, actually. Other safety things include uh, there's, a, there's a fire blanket that would be excellent if you have a kitchen fire and up high you want to make sure that you have a combination smoke detector and carbon monoxide detector whereas down low in this case if we have propane you want to use the propane gas detector the upper cabinets uh, are very helpful but a lot of times vans have like six upper cabinets and it really starts affecting the feel of the vehicle because there's just too many things up high, feels more congested. So I've chosen two, uh, right over the, the kitchen galley area and then a soft cabinet over the bed area. And that way you still have some good place to store things, but it's not too much. Then those upper cabinets need to make sure that they are secured really strong. Uh, and so my rule of thumb is that it, you should be able to do pull-ups on those, uh, those upper cabinets, and then they're probably strong enough. The walls are covered with uh, these fabric panels, so it's essentially a quarter inch plywood, eighth inch closed cell foam, and then it's covered by marathon tweed. And the, this fabric is fire retardant. It's probably the, the most common fabric used for campers. Uh, it gives a soft touch. It helps with sound and both temperature insulation uh, but especially these can be easily removed. Just a few screws, you can take the panel off and then inspect what's behind it. And so gives you that flexibility I was talking about earlier. In the bed area, uh, I've built in cabinetry right underneath the bed so that it, it splits in half with two piano hinges. Uh, so you can put clothes, you can put uh, equipment and gear to have it with you. And that way, uh, you can store a lot of things in a very convenient way. And then in back, the, the garage storage area, as is often referred to, uh, leaves a lot of space. On the right is an over-the-wheel well fresh water tank. And on the left area is the over-the-wheel well electrical. Whereas in the middle section, 
you've got uh, quite a bit of depth there to store a lot of things. And it's also designed so you can use a dog kennel uh, up to about a, about a 50 pound uh, dog kennel can fit inside there. And then when the kennel isn't there, you've got a pass through. So you could put it even like 12 foot two by sixes and things like that as if, if you're needing to um, haul equipment or anything long like that. Many vehicles have the under the chassis, both gray water and black tank, and that often goes along with a, uh, a full wet bath and shower. Because this is designed for off-grid, then the full wet bath and shower uh, isn't a part of the design, partly because oftentimes with the full wet bath and tower, shower, then you have to be at RV sites to have enough water to, to run them and so on. So I use gray water jugs that are smaller, uh, they're easy to dump, and the under the chassis tanks can only be dumped in official RV sites where these, these types of gray water tanks uh, have a lot more flexibility as to where you can uh, dump them. A lot of times even uh, rest stops, city parks, campgrounds, you know, often have public restrooms where it's, it's easy to dump these kinds of jugs. And the because of using the smaller uh, jugs in this area, then it gives you more space to put the things under the kitchen sink that you typically have under the kitchen sink, like paper towels and toilet paper and a garbage can and, and so on. And so makes that more functional, more practical for what people would expect. The fresh water system in a lot of vehicles, it, it tends to be quite elaborate. Oftentimes it's a pressurized system that's under pressure the majority of the time that you're using your camper. And then with many, many connections, each connection has the potential for failure. And so I've in, uh, chosen a over the wheel well tank. Inside that is a submersible pump that's connected to one water hose. And that uh, potable water hose then goes up and connects to the faucet at the sink. So essentially there's just two connections. And then when you turn on the sink, when you turn the handle on, it activates the pump that's back in the tank. So the only time that that system is under pressure is when, the, when you're running the faucet. It's a very quiet system. It has a potential to almost essentially never fail, so to speak. And um, it's also quite easy to, to uh, remove, to be able to repair and access. And, and so all those are very helpful things. I've gone with the Suburban Propane Heater uh, in van circles. The Wabasto style Propex heaters are the most common. And yet um, at least a lot of any of the gas or diesel heaters are known to have quite a bit of a carbonization problem, especially at elevations. And so you can imagine being up at your favorite ski resort up in the mountains, and that's the place where your heater doesn't work. Well, I've chosen to go with a more traditional RV uh, propane heater. These are tried and true. This one's 16,000 BTUs, essentially has no regular maintenance. It works at all altitudes, as well as you can set a thermostat uh, to be you know, like, I want the van to be at 60 degrees and you set the thermostat just like in your house and it'll adjust to that temperature. You can be gone for some time and, and come back and it's a safe situation to leave it on. It's uh, reliable as well as the parts are available. So a number of significant advantage to this type of heater. Thank you for listening to this uh, small movie about the distinctives of our camp builds. And uh, for more information, check us out on campmaker.com. Goodbye.